Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, open up with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 14 and 15 this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. As you're opening there, let me just say what a joy it is uh, to gather together. I do want to make one announcement. We will be having a business meeting on the 26th. That's a Wednesday. So during COVID, we've been doing our business meetings a little differently. We've been doing them at the end of church. We have several things that are coming up that you'll need to vote on that might require a little more discussion uh, than what we're able to do here on Sunday morning. That'll include some financial expenditures and things like that. It is a regularly uh, called business meeting, which means anything coming from a committee can be handled there. So I just want to remind you uh, that don't miss business meetings if you want to want to do business. And so uh, we, we'll encourage you to be there on that uh, Wednesday night, the 26th. Uh, there'll be more information coming in the chimes about the time and, and exactly where that will be right under us in Fellowship Hall. Uh, but nonetheless, I wanted to go ahead and just verbally remind you to put that on your calendar. All good things, all good things coming up at that business meeting, but uh, lots of good progress on, on, on the line here for us. At First Baptist Church, I praise God for that. First, Second Timothy, uh, chapter three, verses fourteen and fifteen. If you have your Bibles open there, why don't we all stand together out of re- re- reverence for the reading of the words of our God? Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God Himself is speaking to us. Beginning verse fourteen. But as for you. Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. O Lord our God, we ask you, if you would, please Open our hearts and minds today to receive your word and to be changed by it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Several years ago, I think it was in 2014, Whitney and I uh, were in Baltimore, Maryland for the Southern Baptist Convention, annual meeting there in June of that year. And uh, we happened to be staying, Whitney was on a committee, and so we wound up in the convention hotel, and it's kind of right attached to the convention center there in Baltimore. Um, it's, for those of you who are baseball fans, it's right there at Camden Yards as well. It's a pretty cool little area there. And so we're there, uh, having a good time. Something happened, I can't even remember what now, but something happened where we needed something in our hotel room. Something wasn't quite right in our hotel room. And so I went down to the front desk, and it's just chaos down there. There are Baptist everywhere and so uh, uh it was just pandemonium and so um more leather blazers than you have ever seen in your life and so and so and so so we went to the i went to the front desk and i talked to the lady there and i said if you can help she said i'll just come take care of it let's just go to your room right now whitney was there in the room and so i said okay let's go so we walk up to the elevators we're about to get on the elevator uh, the, the newly, uh, the just elected president of the Southern Baptist Convention, his name's Ronnie Floyd. He, he now works in Nashville at the executive committee. He's the president of the executive, executive committee. He and a few men were on the elevator. It was too full for us to get on. And we just watched the door close in front of us. I looked at this nice lady who works at this hotel where the Southern Baptist Convention is happening. Thousands of Baptists are crawling around the place. And I said, you know who that is? As the door closed, I didn't. I waited. Um, she said, no, I don't. I said, that's Ronnie Floyd. He's now the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Do you know what that is? And she said, no, I don't. And it was at that moment I realized just how important we really are. <laughs> and just how much it really matters. Now, listen, what's important about what we do as the Southern Baptist Convention, what, what's important about what we do as a church is not how big and bad we are, or who has the most authority, or who's the president, or who's this, or who's that. What matters about what we do as a church is getting the gospel to the nations, and that's certainly what matters about what happens for us as a convention. In fact, I love that people don't, I love it when people don't know who we are. I love boring Baptist meetings, because that means we're actually doing what we're supposed to be doing. 
getting the gospel to the nation. Nonetheless, though, I, it was a good reminder for me in that moment about what matters most in ministry. Because there's a chance that that woman lived next door to a group of local church believers who meant a great deal to her in her life. I certainly hope and pray that's the case. She may not care about what's going on at the big Baptist bureaucratic meetings, but she does care about whether she's loved. You see, those of us who are in ministry and even lay people can sometimes get an outsized view of a pastor or a church's or minister's role in things and in what God is doing in the world. In fact, for me, I'm oftentimes tempted, and I've seen this in lots of pastors and ministers over the years, we can be tempted to start to sort of think that our ministry of the Word is the only one that matters. And I, I can remember being in college or seminary and hearing young men who were learning a lot of deep things about the Word almost scoffing at the church they had come from. T talking about it as if it were not as godly or, or perfect as what they were experiencing here. Now, certainly, there are unhealthy churches and unhealthy situations. Nonetheless, I think sometimes what we can do is miss what really matters. Here we have the Apostle Paul in the twilight of his life and ministry, one of the most brilliant men who's ever lived, in my opinion, and certainly probably the most brilliant Christian thinker in the history of the church. You read Paul's writings and they're magnificent. You think about someone like Timothy who got to study under Paul, who got to live ministry under Paul, who was sent out by Paul. And as Paul is in the twilight of his life writing this letter to his young protege, probably one of the last communications he ever had to Timothy, notice what he says all from the get-go, early on, chapter 1, verse 5, he says to Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. We all think those are southern names. Those are Bible names. That's how they became southern names, right? In fact, some of us in this room might have a mother... Turn. I never turned my microphone on this morning, did I, Scotty? I forgot to turn my microphone on. Well, by God's grace, it's on now. Here we go. Eunice and Lois. Some of y'all might have Eunice's and Lois's in the family tree this morning. But here's what Paul's doing. He's talking to Timothy about his ministry going off into the future, what ministry might look like without his mentor, Paul. And certainly there's plenty of reference to their relationship and what Paul has taught him. But in the midst of doing this, he's pointing him back to what he learned from Mama and Mama. There's something to be said about that. No, notice in these verses that we're looking at today, I think we see Paul alluding to these women again when he says, from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the Holy Scriptures. Now consider this truth this morning, mothers, grandmothers. You may not be the Apostle Paul. Uh, you, you may not be the greatest theologian in the world. Uh, you, you, you may not have the sort of tools and gifts you think you need to have an impact on the kingdom of Christ, but consider this reality that when this great man is talking to another great man, two of the most well-known men in the Bible, the sort of faith that he's talking about and commending to him is the one he received from his mother and his grandmother. What you are doing in your home, what you are doing with the children of your children, what you are doing in the simple things in life is not inconsequential. And I would tell you, I would tell you 100%, it's certainly not less than what I'm doing in this pulpit every Sunday. In fact, one could argue perhaps it's even more important than this word. It's so easy to get an outsized view of the things that are seen and the things that are on stages and the things that are out front to the neglect of those simple, everyday things that God has given us to do. The great Baptist, one of the great men of the faith, the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, said this, Fathers and mothers are the most natural agents for God to use 
in the salvation of their children. I'm sure that in my early youth, no teaching ever made such an impression upon my mind as the instruction of my mother. Now understand that Spurgeon was from a line of pastors. But he says, my, the instruction of my mother, neither can I conceive that to any child there can be one who will have such influence over the heart as the mother who has so tenderly cared for our offspring. Moms and dads, not just moms, moms and dads, families, today I want you to know that what you do is so important in the spiritual lives of your children. And this morning, as we look at these, these simple two verses, I, I want to show you three truths that can lead you, I think, this morning to make three commitments to make this morning related to how you will raise your children. Now, some of us are down the line, some of us are early on, some of us are still waiting to be parents, to have our children. But these are still three commitments that you can make, and perhaps this is the commitment you need to make as a grandparent, or as an aunt or uncle, or as a mentor. Three commitments that you can make this morning to help uh, do God's work in the home. Here's the first. Pass down the essential word. Uh, pass down the essential word. Now, there are all sorts of essential things in the life of a child. And one thing I've noticed, uh, the older I get as a pastor and the longer, I've, I've been a, a dad now for a decade in December. Now, we're not all the way down the line, but I've been a parent for a little bit now. And one thing I've learned is that list of things that are essential for children seems to get longer every year. Every time I turn around, there's something else somebody's saying. If you don't do this with your kids, you're going to wind up with weirdos or crazy people or parents doing this is what's wrong in society. And if we want to have a decent society, you ought to be doing this. And if you want your kids to go to college, you better be doing this. And if you want your kids to be well-adjusted, you better do this. It feels like that list just gets longer and longer and longer. But I I want us all here to know there are important things in the life of our children. I, I don't think it's wrong or, wrong or a sin to care about the future of your child in terms of college, all these things. We, we care about those things. We think about these things. But have we ever missed, perhaps, that the Word is such an essential, the Word of God, the Bible, is such an essential ingredient in the life of a child? Do you see what Paul's doing for Timothy here as he, as he talks to him about the faith that he received from his mother and his grandmother? As he goes on to talk about these scriptures with which he's well acquainted, Paul is painting a picture here, not only in these two verses, but really in the end of chapter 3 on into chapter 4. He's painting a picture of the fact that the word is essential for Timothy as a man of God. He's preparing him for persecution. He's preparing him for the rise of false teachers. He's preparing him for people who pretend to be Christians but really aren't, for imposters. He's preparing him for the loss of his mentor. He's preparing him for stealing his resolve and stealing his calling to the preaching of the Word. He, he gives him an important word as he's talking about this. What does he say? Verse 14, do you see this word? But as for you, continue in what you have learned. That, that word continue is so important. Because to be able to continue in something you've learned, you have to have learned it already. And then he says, remember from whom you have learned it, continue in it, and remember how from childhood you have been acquainted with the Scriptures. Paul is pointing Timothy not only to some sort of new knowledge from Paul, or he's not saying you need to go, go find something new, you need to go read this book, you need to go do this, you need to go do that. No, he says, continue in what you know already. On the wellspring of knowledge of the Word of God and experience of living out the Word of God, that began for you in childhood, Timothy. Go back to those things. Continue in those things. Do you see the importance of what we do, parents? Grandparents, do you see the importance of pointing our children to the Word of God? Do you see the importance of building for them a life that's built on the Word of God? Just the other day, 
And I, you don't have to call Sunday the Lord's Day, but I said something about the Lord's Day. And it's just a way we try to help our children see the importance of worship and the importance of having a day set aside to worship the Lord. We're not strict Sabbatarians in our home, but we do want to honor the fact that this day belongs to the Lord. We do different things on this day. We try to make it a day that's special, especially for corporate worship. And Ford said, why don't we just call it Sunday? Why don't we just call it Sunday? I said, well, buddy, I'm reminding you it's not just another day. It's the Lord's day. It's a day that's dedicated to Him. Now, that's just a small thing. There are all sorts of small and tiny ways that we can help our children see the Word of God in the ebb and flow of the life of our family, and we can help them store God's Word in their hearts. Just like the thought of, as my child gets older, remembering we celebrated the Lord's day. This reality, this reality that the Word is essential and this reality that we're supposed to pass this Word down, let's allow this to produce some things in our lives. One is consistency in teaching. Uh, consistency in teaching these things to our children. The fact Paul is highlighting these two women, Eunice and Lois, the fact that Paul is talking to Timothy about continuing in what he learned it implies a sort of consistency of, of life and teaching that came from Timothy's family. I think it's a consistency that we ought to have in our own lives. But we're committed to teaching the Word of God to our children. Second of all, I think it ought to remind us of the importance of the Word of God. If it was this important for Timothy, won't it be important for our children as well? And here's a, a third thing I hope it will help produce in all of us as parents here is this reminder that if the only Bible your children get is Bible at church, then they might not get all the Bible they need. Now, we're going to give them as much Bible as we can give them here. You know, this, we're, not, we're not, I mean, we, they get popcorn too, but, you, you know, I mean, the reality is we're going to give them as much Bible as we can give them. We're, we're, not, we're not the sort of church that says, well, because parents ought to be teaching their children, we ought to just exclusively let parents teach them and, and just always outsource that. No, we're church and we want them to learn the Bible here too. We're not trying to duck from that sort of responsibility, but what I do want to remind you of is that we are here to resource and equip you. We're not the main thing that's happening. We're not the main thing that's going on. We're here to help resource and equip you and help give you tools to continue that work at home. I want you to remember how essential this word is for our children to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. Oh, I hope you'll long and pray for your child's salvation. I hope you'll do all you can to help your children see what, how Christians ought to live. But one of the reasons I'm afraid that so many people leave the church after they leave the home is because they've not been given the tools and resources by their homes or their church to live the life they've been told they need to live. Godliness is hard as it is. It's especially hard without the Bible in your heart. It's especially hard when you've just been given a list of rules and expectations that aren't rooted in the text of the Bible. I hope that we will help people see how essential the Word is for our children to have a vision of godliness in their lives. Paul goes on in verse 16 to say, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is why I preach through books of the Bible. This is why I point you to the Bible constantly, because you need the tools to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. And we owe this essential word to our children as well. Not only must we pass down the essential word, but second of all, we must pass down the unchanging word. Pass down the unchanging word. Our daughter, Watts, was our first child. I mentioned this earlier. She was, she's nine years old now. She'll be ten in December. And so I can remember early on when we first had her, had a baby, uh, I can remember the conversations with grandparents that we had. And by grandparents, I mean my dad. And so we would talk to them about child safety and things like that. And we would say, 
listen, Dad, you know, if you're gonna, we got to do this. We're not taking her to church till this time or whatever, because that's what the pediatrician said and said, you know, we got to put the car seat in right and all this kind of stuff. And I think you've probably heard these lines before. And, you know, my dad said, I can remember doing this. And I turned out just fine. I'm just, we're totally safe. And I think you guys know me well enough to know my answer to that was, right, that's because the ones that died aren't here to talk about it, Dad. <laughs> uh, you know how I am. You know, I, can, I'm, I can remember having my phone out, Googling infant mortality rates in 1958 when my dad was born, you know, like, they've gotten a lot better, Dad, maybe we should listen, you know. From time to time, even with our three children, things changed. Th things get different. What, they, what people say you ought to do with your child or how you ought to educate them or how you ought to do this, it seems like it changes a lot. That, that which we ought to be doing seems to change sometimes. Now, I'm not, I think it's on good data. I'm all in on doing what we're supposed to do. But here's the reality. As important as it is for us to keep a, a good eye on the safety of our children, as, as things change, as we learn more, as we get new data, we know we want to be careful with them. How important is it? How much more important is it for us to give them, to pass down to them, the unchanging Word of God? Something that never changes. So many things do change, but I can tell you that you can be sure that teaching the unchanging Word will produce no regret. All other ground but Christ is shifting sand in this world. And it's important to educate our children. It's important to prepare our children for the world. But surely we can see how important it is to teach our children to build their lives on the rock of the Word of God. Think again about what, what Paul said to Timothy. He said, continue in that which you've learned since childhood, you've known these things. Isn't it amazing that now, as a man in ministry, Paul is talking to him about what he learned in the nursery and what he learned in Sunday school and what he learned on the knee of his mother and his grandmother. Isn't it interesting the way that that which he learned as a child was still relevant to him as a pastor years later? How many more things can we say that about? You see, the unchanging word gives us comfort in trials. So many of us long to keep our children from trials. We can't though, can we? I'll never forget, Whitney was pregnant again with Watsy. And I said, I can't wait to get through this first trimester so I can quit worrying. And then I said, I can't wait for her to get here so I can quit worrying. And I said, I can't wait for her to get about, I don't know, six months old and I can just quit worrying. Man, maybe when she gets to kindergarten, I can, and you know what I've realized now? I'm never going to stop worrying. Uh, we so long to protect our children from these things, but what if we could give them, instead of worrying about these things and longing to do something that only God can do, what if instead we gave Him His Word that could sustain them and comfort them in the midst of the trials they will inevitably face? We so long for our children to not grow up in a dark world, but what if we can give them God's Word that is a light shining in the darkness? It is a light for their path as they walk. We so worry sometimes about what life will look like in the future for our children but what we can do is give them God's word that gives them hope for the future we so long and see the way that all kinds of identities are being thrust on our children throughout the world but what if we could give them the word that gives them a strong and sure identity in Christ we are so worried we are so anxious about a changing world but by God's grace we can give our children an unchanging word that will help them navigate any trial, any challenge, any change that may come. We can give our children wisdom for life. Not just the imperfect wisdom we have. I will give my kids bad advice. It's inevitable. But if I give them the word, they have perfect wisdom that they're storing in their heart. The word is essential, it's unchanging. And yet with all these things we see about what the Word gives our children, what is most important remains. We must finally pass down the sufficient Word. We, we must pass down the sufficient Word. Do you see what Paul says? He says, 
But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. And don't miss this last phrase, it's my favorite one, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Each time Whitney was pregnant with one of our children, she bought a journaling Bible. And she would take this journaling Bible, and for the first year of their life, or for some period of their life, she would take notes uh, on my sermons or Bible studies she was doing, whatever. She's reading the Bible. She's taking notes. And later in their lives, we'll give each of those children the Bible that we have for them. She's used it for years and taken notes in it. She's done it for the boys and, and for Watsy as well. One time we're at another church, and we hear a testimony about how the Bible was a good book to help with life and to give wisdom. And over and over again, this gentleman kept saying, you know, and I got this Bible and it taught me good morals. And if I didn't have this Bible, I wouldn't have good morals. And morals, 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 morals. And finally, I was about to blow my stack. So I reached over, I grabbed that journal and Bible from Whitney. I give me the pen. And I write, scribble in it as fast as I can. The Bible is not about morals, it's about Jesus. Love, Dad. More than anything, we want our children to know and love God. You know, I don't really care how moral my children are if they don't know and love God. I don't care how many rules they follow if they don't know and love God. I I, I want them to know and love the Lord And the only way for them to know God and to love God is to hear and receive the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see the beauty of what Paul is saying? He's saying this word is sufficient to give you all that you need by God's grace to hear the gospel, to receive the gospel, and to be wise, the Bible says, unto salvation. This word that we can give our children is sufficient for salvation. Isn't it beautiful how an acquaintance with the Word of God can produce eternal life in the hearts of our children? We so long for our kids to be saved. Unleash the powerful Word of God in their lives. Isn't it amazing when you think about the fact that the Spirit is at work through the Word that He inspired to bring sinners from life to death? How the Lord Jesus is pursuing your child through the pages of Scripture? Isn't it amazing that our precious children might stumble their way through mouthing out strange words like Melchizedek or justification? And little do they know and little can we see at times that they are on their way as they stumble through those words. They're on their way to the celestial city. Isn't it amazing that the meager seeds of our attempts to teach our children the Word will produce an eternal, infinite harvest of righteousness. You don't have to know it perfectly. You don't have to know everything about it. Uh, you, 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 you don't have to be perfect in the way you handle devotions or worship in your home or just passing the Word along in casual ways. You, you don't have to be perfect in these things. God can take these meager seeds and He can produce an infinite, eternal harvest of righteousness in the lives of our children. Every week I work hard to give you the word. If nothing else, it might not be funny, it might not be good, it might not be exciting, but at least every Sunday the the least I can do is say, we got the word. If you can leave here saying we got the word, I'll be happy. The work of the church matters. But don't you see how important it is, even with a word-centered church, to have a word-centered home. You know, I believe with all my heart that God's going to call faithful lay people. God's going to call faithful deacons. God's going to call faithful committee members. God's going to call faithful missionaries. God's going to call faithful pastors. Some of them might have sung on the stage today. And I like to imagine myself as an old, retired pastor. I'll be driving the train at Nakalula Falls. And I like to imagine going home to my study and sitting down and writing an email or a letter to a young preacher boy from his pastor or to a young woman on the mission field from her pastor. And for all that I plan to tell them, my greatest prayer is as I point them back 
to the Word of God and to His sweet church, to His dear mother, to His dear father, as I write to them about what they were like as a child and how I'm for them and I love them and how their old preacher will always be for them, I'm going to write them and say, keep going. Keep going in the way. Keep pursuing Jesus. Keep taking that word you heard us preach, that word you heard us teach. Keep going. That word you heard mom and dad share with you from the very earliest days of your life. Keep going. Keep going in the way. Never forget from whom you learned. I want to offer an invitation this morning. If you've never put your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus, I want you today to do just that. I believe if you'll turn from your sins in repentance, turn to God through faith in Jesus, He will receive you with open arms. After this prayer here in just a moment, I want you to do business with the Lord. And second of all, you may be a Christian, you may be a parent. This altar is open for you right now to pray for anything you want to pray about. Finally, you may be looking for a church home. I'd love to talk to you today about what it means for you to be a member here at First Baptist Church. After this prayer, whether it be here or right where you are, here at the altar or right where you are, I want you to do business with the Lord Jesus Christ. After this prayer, I want to invite you to come. Let's pray together.